What's up guys, Kasangu here and welcome back to another Destiny 2 video. Today I want to conclude my set of videos on the Grasp of Avarice dungeon with a guide on how to complete this dungeon's solo flawless triumph on any of the three classes. I'll go over some general advice for doing the solo flawless run as a whole, but then, as usual, I'll also give specific tips for each section based on how I went about doing it for each class. Thank you again for watching and let's talk about how to do the solo flawless version of Grasp of Avarice. As for rewards, the only thing that is going to be tied specifically to the solo flawless run of this dungeon is the typical emblem. The emblem for this dungeon solo flawless version is on your screen right now, and it is called Piratical Ambitions. However, if you also have not done a normal flawless run, you will also be rewarded with the Ensilvered Snare Shader from the normal flawless triumph. This triumph can be completed in a fire team of three, but it is also the shader that is the default color scheme for the armor from this dungeon. Other than that, there's not any other specific rewards for this triumph other than the bragging rights, but both the emblem and the shader are very nice in my opinion, and definitely warrant the challenge of doing the solo flawless dungeon. We're going to start with general loadout advice as well, and so if you don't want general loadout advice, skip to the timestamp on your screen, which is where I'll start talking about the specific encounters. I'll also have a list of timestamps in the description for each encounter specifically if you just want help with one section. For general loadout advice though, I recommend again running very defensive loadouts. Utilizing defensive exotics and mods will help you stay alive, and since you're solo and every enemy in the dungeon is going to be focused on you, you're going to want to stay alive, and defensive mods are a great way to do that. My other recommendation is to avoid using explosive weapons that are capable of damaging yourself, since these can be really, really dangerous, especially in this dungeon where everything is very close range. The Scorch Cannons can disappear on one shot if you're charging the explosion for too long, and I did actually have this kill one of my runs on the final boss encounter, so be very careful with your loadout. I used a Blinding Grenade Launcher for a few runs, but I eventually swapped to a Shotgun instead since most of the encounters are very short range, and the Shotgun does not have the danger of accidentally killing yourself like a Blinding Grenade Launcher does. For my armor mods, I never took off Protective Light on any of my characters at any point, but I did use a variety of other mods as well. Reaping Wellmaker and Well of Tenacity were also very useful, but you can also choose to go with Explosive Wellmaker and Well of Life. Since you don't need to use explosive weapons capable of damaging yourself to activate it, you can even use things like Hand Cannons with Explosive Payload or the Scorch Cannons in the dungeon to activate Explosive Wellmaker. Your grenades are also capable of activating that mod. So, even though I did say not to use Explosive Weapons, Explosive Wellmaker has plenty of safe ways to activate it, and you can pair that with Well of Life for constant healing. The last thing that I recommend, regardless of your class, is to pick a super that you're very comfortable with, since the Burden of Riches buff will be restoring your ability energy very frequently. I used defensive supers, but I know that other supers like Thunder Crash or Nova Bomb can also be extremely useful here as well. When I get to the encounter-specific portions, I will be telling you which supers I used, as well as a couple alternates that I think are very good, but again, you can use whatever you want. It's your run, not mine. I will just be telling you what I used. For class-specific builds, you do have a few options, since a variety of builds are viable in this dungeon. Starting with Titans, pretty much any Titan subclass is usable here. Titans have a lot of healing and shielding available to them, and if you like Striker Titan, I recommend either using Thunder Crash with Curious of the Falling Star, or Bottom Tree Striker with your preference of Exotic, since you can use the Reversal perk to keep your health up, and the Super for killing adds is fantastic. If you want to use a Solar Titan, you can opt for either the Middle or Bottom Tree again, but I recommend the Bottom Tree more since the Power of Sunspots cannot be underestimated, as well as its synergy with both the Path of Burning Steps Exotics and the Phoenix Cradle, combined with its powerful healing to keep you alive. If you want to do a Void Titan, which is my personal recommendation for this dungeon, then opt for Top Tree Void to get Bubble Shield, and then run either Helm of Saint-14 to blind enemies that come in and give you an overshield when you step out of the bubble, or you can run the No Backup Plans Gauntlets with a Shotgun to keep your defensive strike always active and keep it off cooldown. This will allow you to keep a ton of overshields on you and provide you with bubble as a good panic super and damage buff, and if you then also need a roaming super for killing adds, you'll have the normal sentinel shield, albeit without any of the buffs from the other trees. When I did this on my Titan, I ran the Bubble Titan for every single encounter, so it is my recommendation for Titans attempting the Solo Flawless Triumph. 
For hunters, I recommend that you run a setup using the Assassin's Cowl Helmet, regardless of whatever subclass you use. It allows you to consistently keep full health and invisibility by getting either a Powered Melee and a Finisher. Depending on the strength of the enemy that you kill with either your Powered Melee or Finisher, you can get more than 10 seconds of invisibility off of one Finisher, and you will always get full health off of those Finishers, or Powered Melees. If you decide to run the Night Stalker on any of its trees, which all have invisibility built in, then I recommend Wormhust Crown if you don't want Assassin's Cowl. But in general, I think that the Cow is much better for a solo flawless dungeon than the Wormhust Crown, even on Night Stalker, which like I mentioned, does have invisibility built in. As for your subclass, I think any of them are fine, but personally, I used Stasis because of the double charged melee and crowd control potential, as well as the recent Shattered Eye buff in PvE. For every single encounter, I ran Assassin's Cow with Stasis Hunter. For Warlocks, you can run either Well, Stasis, or Devour Voidwalker here. I recommend either the Well of Radiance or Devour build, but Stasis is also very strong with the Bleak Watcher turret and Ice Flare bolts keeping enemies locked down. I will recommend the Stag for pretty much every section, since its damage resistance will make you nearly unkillable while you're in your Rift, and the nearly departed buff will help you keep your Rift up more often. Sure, you will not benefit at all from the stag perk that spawns a rift after you die, but the other perks on the stag that do not require you to die make it an extremely powerful option for warlocks. Outside of the stag, you could also use something like Lunafaction Boots for better DPS and boss encounters, or Sanguine Alchemy for higher rift uptime. But I do recommend the stag over both of those for survivability and Lunafaction Boots for damage. If you choose to run Devour, you don't necessarily need any specific exotic, but you can also do the Thorn in combination with the Necrotic Grip for very fast ad clear and constant Devour activation. I did switch between builds a lot when I ran this on my Warlock, so honestly, any of these work. Just go with whatever you think is best for you. On to the specific encounters, though. We'll start with the opening. I just used cover to clear my way up to the cave, and then I spawn camp the enemies that spawn in the cave using Wither Horde. I saved my super for the knights after I dropped down through the crystal cave, and I used either Wither Horde or a sniper for the shrieker depending on which class I was on and just what weapon I had equipped. During the section in the reservoir, I again used Wither Horde to deal with the thrall, and later the shrieker that would spawn, but again, you can use a sniper rifle if you'd like. Other than that, I have no other specific advice for this section, so just watch your jumps, be careful, and don't run into the spike traps. Make your way to the ogre encounter and get ready for your first boss. For the ogre, you want to run a chess piece with preferably a void resist mod that has either melee resist or concussive dampener. For weapons, I used an SMG for my primary weapon, either a shotgun or a fusion rifle as my special weapon, and then I used sleeper simulant as my heavy weapon for DPS. I avoided the engrams from the first few acolytes since they won't make a difference for how many phases you'll need of the side rooms, and they just add the risk of getting killed either by the ogre while trying to turn them in, or getting killed by the riches debuff if you don't realize that you accidentally picked up an engram. Once you kill the Scorch Cannon Vandal, pick up his Scorch Cannon from underneath the platform that he stands on and get started for engram phase. No matter what your class is, I would say to use your super in the side rooms since you will get it back after picking up 10 engrams. You can just use the Scorch Cannon to clear adds if you want, but I didn't try to save the Scorch Cannon between opening doors. I'd turn in my 10 plus engrams from the side that I cleared, grab a new Scorch Cannon, and just keep repeating this until DPS phase started. You can do DPS on the crystal if you want, but I would recommend moving over to the left and setting up next to a box, or moving over to the right and setting up by the tunnel so that the ogre is not right on top of you. It seems inconsistent to me as to whether or not the ogre will stomp when in melee range, so I just try and keep my distance. I recommend jiggle peeking the boss to do more damage to them, since that will prevent him from doing too much damage to you, and with Sleeper having a charge time, it's actually very, very easy to just peek right as it's going to fire, peek back, charge again, and then peek right as it's going to fire again. Depending on your super, you might want to save it for the next phase of the fight, since you won't be able to get it back until doing at least one more round of the Scorch Cannon rooms. Depending on your class, you might need to save your super for the next round of Scorch Cannons, but you may also need it for boss damage if it's something like Bubble or Well. Repeat this until the boss is dead and move on. For the Sparrow run, I would say that your pathing is really the only thing that's super important, but I used a few different tricks as well that I felt helped me to do it a little safer. If you have it, use the Scourge of the Past's Raid Sparrow always on time, since it is slightly faster than other exotic sparrows in the game, despite its speed stat displaying the usual 160. For mine A, hit the first switch on your right and ignore the one on the left, since you can avoid the sniper that way. For mine B, ignore the first switch on the right, but do get the second one on the left. For mine C, you can really easily hit both switches, but you only need the one inside the part of the crashed ship, which is on your way to the mine. And for mine D, I grabbed the first switch on the right side, and I ignored the second one on the upper cannon path. For taking your sparrow across the jump, you can do either a trick, like a backflip, or stop boosting to land safely. And once mine D is dismantled, you're done. 
The other thing I did was very quickly dismount and resummon my sparrow at each mine to ensure that I had a full health sparrow going into each section. And lastly, I'm not sure if this has any effect on sparrow durability, but I ran arc resist mods with concussive dampener as well as using risk runner and having it in my hands when I hit the switch at the start of the encounter. Since you do not need weapons in this section, it literally cannot hurt to have this as your loadout. Again, I have no clue if this actually does affect the durability, but I put it on just in the case that it might. And you know, again, it does not hurt to have them equipped. If this part gives you trouble, I will also recommend just trying it several times over and over and over until you get it down. Since practicing the Sparrow Run is the best way to get through it every time, it'll allow you to find what pathing works for you. And again, the best way to do any encounter of a Solo Flawless Dungeon when it's giving you trouble is to just run it over and over again until you're able to do it consistently. For the Fallen Shield encounter, I ran Risk Runner with a sword and a shotgun since almost all the damage is arc in this encounter, but I did actually equip Solar Resist and Concussive Dampener to my chest piece to keep me safe from the Scorch Vandals, since Risk Runner gave me all the damage resistance I needed for the Dregs and Captain's arc weapons. Your subclass is up to you, but I used Stasis Hunter with Assassin's Cowl, Thunder Crash Titan with Cures of the Falling Star, and Devour Voidwalker with Lunifaction Boots but you can run something else like Sanguine Alchemy on your Warlock if you'd like. I just didn't take my Luna Faction boots off. And the only other thing that I did in this section was double tap my jump ability right as I came into the platforms to avoid getting potentially killed by the fall. And I had my sword just in the event that the jump wasn't quite gonna put me on the platform I needed and I could use it to swipe back onto the platform. Other than that, do this encounter as normal. Not much changes here. The strategy is just still kill, deposit, kill the servitor, launch the servitor, and then go to the middle when it's all done. However, for the last encounter, the final boss does get a little tougher here, since you have to deal with everything by yourself, and in a solo run, this encounter is very, very long. It took me nearly 40 minutes to do just this part on every character that I did it on, since trying to go too fast is a good way to end up dying and having to start over. You are massively benefited by going slow. I once again ran a Stasis Hunter with Assassin's Cowl, a Bubble Titan with Helm of Saint-14, and Well of Radiance Warlock with Luna Faction Boots for each of my runs. For weapons, I used a Shotgun with Risk Runner and a Legendary Linear Fusion Rifle. I specifically used Reed's Regret, but the Threaded Needle is also very good. Sleeper Simulant is still really, really great here, but its extra damage came at the cost of survivability, so I used Risk Runner for all the arc damage in this encounter. As for strategy, your first priority is going to be to maintain the high ground as often as possible. The two pirate ship shaped areas on the sides are safest since the boss and his crew actually have to shoot up towards you and some of their shots will be eaten by the platform that you're standing on. The low ground by the entrance is much more dangerous since they have to shoot down at you and there's not quite as much cover and there are still a few weird kill barriers down there so it's just safer to avoid it if you can. As soon as possible, I kill the Sniper Shank, since this takes out the more dangerous of his two crewmates, as well as taking away the boss's ability to throw web mines. If you opted for Sleeper Simulant, just shoot the Shank with that, since it does really good body shot damage and can kill the Shank in just a few shots, and you'll get a lot more heavy from all the dregs that you're going to have to go through with your primary weapon, and you'll probably have Finder and Scavenger mods on. If you did not use Sleeper, then you will need to use the Scorch Cannon to kill the Shank, since the Legendary Linear has a much worse body shot ratio than Sleeper. Once the Shank is dead, just kill the Stealth Vandal in the middle, and if you want to, you can choose to go grab and deposit the engrams he drops. You don't have to if you don't want to be a little riskier. From there, start taking down the Scorch Cannon Vandal again, take the Scorch Cannon to each side of the room, and open the engram pods. Each platform will drop 10 engrams, and you can get up to 20 if you grab the engrams off the platform that you're on and then off the low ground. But if you don't want to risk going to the low ground, you can just do 10 per drop, since that will be enough to restore all of your ability energy. I used my super a lot during this part on every single character that I ran it on, since it comes back from each engram set. You can spam your super here. You can use it in the middle to stay alive while depositing, which I did if I was a well or bubble titan, and when I was on a Hunter, I used Silence and Squall to keep the dregs under control. Keep running around and opening pods until DPS phase starts. After DPS phase starts, drop your Well or Bubble on top of the Crystal and start damaging the boss. However, if you play a Hunter or Thunder Crash Titan here, then go to the small platform to the left of the boss in the back of the room and shoot him from there. Since you don't have an easy way to stay alive while taking fire, but that little platform provides enough cover to stay alive and keeps you safe from the adds. 
When the DPS phase ends, bail out to either the right or the left of the middle and get ready to clear adds and kill crewmates again. If you ended up going on the little platform in the back, you're going to have to go down onto the pirate ship shaped platform next to it, but that is a safe spot to go to. Don't worry about having to go there, just kill the dregs and get ready to do the crewmates again. Repeat these phases until the boss is dead, but remember to take your time. This boss fight will take a long time in between DPS phases, so just make sure that you play carefully enough that you don't end up dying because you rushed too quickly. For this fight, slow and defensive play is the best way to get through it. Once the boss is dead, though, you're done, and congratulations on completing your solo flawless version of Grasp of Avarice. That is all I have for this guide, so if you liked it or found it helpful for your completion of a solo flawless run of Grasp or Avarice, remember that a like is greatly appreciated and goes a long way to help out my channel, and if you're new around here, be sure to subscribe if you want to catch any more videos from me, and follow my Twitch linked down below if you want to catch some live streams. And as always, thank you so much for watching, I have been Kazungu, and I will see you all in the next one.